ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to tonight's presentation. Uh, this is the first presentation this year of the Physics Alumni Lecture Series. Um, tonight's speaker is Rakshak. Uh, Rakshak Adhikari was a student here, um, graduated two years ago, with degrees in mathematics and physics. Uh, while here, he was great student. Uh, we all enjoyed having him in class. Those of us who taught him, those of you who knew him, he's hard to not get along with. <laughs> um, he is currently a graduate student at the University of Kansas, uh, working in the group of Dr. Medi Med I can't pronounce the name. I'm sorry. Med Med He'll pronounce it for me. Um, and he's here to talk to us about a little bit of their research in cosmology. And um, so, Rakshak, uh, take it away. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Rakshak. Uh, I used to be a student here. Um, I currently am a grad student, at, a second year grad student at the University of Kansas. Um, I'm almost finished with my coursework and I'm slowly getting on with my research. Uh, I work with uh, I work in cosmology, um, and I work with um, Dr. Mikhail Medvedev um, at KU. Um, Ryan Lowe is uh, another student collaborator of mine, um, and I'll be discussing. I'll briefly be discussing. Well, I'll briefly be discussing basic cosmology, and then we'll move to uh, the specifics of my research. Uh, that is flavor mixed. Uh, the cosmology of flavor mixed dark matter. Uh, let's see. Okay, that's good. Um, so, um, cosmology generally, or colloquially, it's just considered the study of the universe. Um, what we are doing is uh, physical cosmology. There's a lot of other metaphysical aspect to the, the word itself. So to distinguish that, um, we call it physical cosmology. We are usually studying uh, the physical properties of the universe, um, mainly focusing on the origin of the universe itself. And uh, we also look at large scale structure of the universe. Um, that is scales usually larger than galaxies. But as you'll see sometimes um, uh, for study of general phenomena, we also um, look at uh, galactic levels and sometimes even slightly subgalactic levels. So in modern cosmology, um, we have uh, the standard, we, we have what we call the standard model of cosmology, just like we have uh, one in the standard model of particle physics, although uh, it's, it's different in cosmology because of like what cosmology is as a science. Um, so, so the modern, uh, so the, uh, the standard model of cosmology, uh, it's also called the lambda CDM model or the concordance model. So it is basically um, specified by these um, variables. Um, so the lamb it's called lambda CDM cosmology, where uh, lambda stands for the cosmological constant, which, is, which uh, represents dark energy. It is, a for, uh, it is an entity that is not very well known. Um, we uh, know it in its effect that it is accelerating the expansion of universe. So the universe is expanding, and recent research has shown that the, the rate of expansion is accelerating. And this is the thing uh, that is causing it. Um, but what I'm interested in is, I have this. Can you guys see this? Yeah, so baryons are the stuff that we and the stars are made up of. So basically, all, all visible matter in the universe is baryons, protons, neutrons. Well, we have some leptons, but we tend to ignore that. Um, they, they only form 4.9% of the total mass energy content in the universe. So Einstein's uh, famous mass energy formula it gives us a way to compare those two. And in that, we have baryons only making about 5% of the total mass energy content. Um, we have most of it is just dark energy. Um, and 26.8% of it is dark matter. So when we only talk about matter, uh, so, so we have 80% um, of the matter in the universe uh, is dark matter. And 
as the name suggests, the name is slightly misleading, but this is another thing we don't totally understand. We, are, we kind of understand it a bit more than we understand dark energy, but it's still the, the, the precise nature of this is an, an open problem in cosmology and physics in general. Um, these components themselves, you can have a talk of, on their own. Um, so we'll not be discussing these. Uh, I'll not be discussing these. But I'll try to um, historically uh, motivate the historical events that led to our understanding of it to motivate my part of the work. So we start with, um, so this is, I think, early 1900s. Um, early 1900s. So we have an American astronomer. Actually, I actually don't know if he's an American, so I should not be saying that on record. An astronomer in America, let's say. Um, so Hubble was looking at galaxies. Um, so for uh, if anybody uh, is unsure, galaxies are basically um, huge collections of stars. Um, it's, it's a very rough definition. But they have um, stars in uh, hundreds of billions. So you have, uh, So that is a galaxy, and he, Hubble was looking at I think no more than a few dozen galaxies, and he saw a clear pattern. He saw that uh, no matter what part of the sky he'd look at, the galaxies there are moving away from us. So in all directions, galaxies were moving away from us. And he also noticed a peculiar thing. He noticed that the farther the galaxies were, they were moving faster. So this is, uh, this is basically, I think we can say that this is where uh, cosmology in its modern form started. So if we, um, there were like a significant errors in these measurements and stuff, which were later refined and all that, the, but the basic principle still holds. So this gave rise to our current model of the origin of the universe, which probably everybody is familiar with. It's called the hot Big Bang model. So the basic idea of this is if, if everything in the universe is uh, moving further and further away from us, if we extrapolate that back in time, we see that some time ago the universe was denser. And if we keep on going, we get like a, a point where the universe was infinitely dense and infinitely hot. Um, that's a, that is just a, a rough extrapolation, of course, but it holds for like very, very early times. So from this, we have the hot Big Bang model. So this is all the basic cosmology I'm talking. Uh, we can directly move to uh, our, the start of our journey of dark matter. So this is um, Fritz Zwicky. Now I know he, he's a Swiss-American astronomer. So he was looking at uh, the coma cluster. So a, a, coma, a cluster is basically, so just like galaxies are groups of stars, um, clusters are groups of galaxies, although clusters usually have uh, galaxies of about uh, like a, a few hundred to a few thousand, I think. This one has about 1,000 galaxies. So he was looking at uh, this cluster and looking at the speed of the galaxy, so, the, uh, so just like stars are usually, excuse me, so just like stars are moving inside galaxies, galaxies are moving inside clusters. Um, he looked at the speed of galaxies and he realized that um, the speed they have is different from uh, the speed suggested by their mass. So the, the general idea here, uh, we'll repeat this idea, so I think it's um, worth uh, describing. Um, so from the brightness of luminous objects, by luminous objects, I mean all uh, objects that emit light. So most, bar well, all variants will emit light. Um, we have stars and galaxies. In this case, he, w he was looking at the brightness of galaxies. And looking at the brightness of galaxies, you can um, infer their mass to, uh, with, with a certain accuracy. So he looked at the brightness of uh, these galaxies, and he calculated the total mass. And once you have the total mass, you can, um, if the speed is caused by gravity, you can um, very easily calculate the speed of objects that are moving because of uh, that gravitational force. When he did that, he saw that they are moving way, way faster than what the luminous mass suggests. So this was, and this was a huge discrepancy at the time, 400 times. Um, there are errors to this because back then it wasn't known how much gas is in a cluster. So most of, okay, apparently clusters mass comes from gas, but again, the basic principle still holds. So he named it uh, dark, he named, so he hypothesized that if it is moving really fast, then there must be some mass to hold it. Otherwise, uh, they will just, they are so moving so fast that they would just rip through the galaxies. Uh, their speeds were much higher than the escape velocity of the, of the cluster um, when he only accounted for the luminous matter. So he called uh, this uh, mysterious matter, um, dark matter, although he named it in German and I totally forgot what the word was. Um, 
Unfortunately, his work was um, either ignored or not considered seriously or something like that because um, we don't have much work on this until the uh, 1970s uh, when Ford and Vera Rubin, um, I forgot the first name of the other guy, but Ford and Vera Rubin were looking at spiral galaxies. Um, so this was in the 1970s and they found another discrepancy uh, that, that's very similar. Uh, so spiral galaxies are basically well, they're galaxies with a, a spherical bulge. Uh, so you can think of them as like a sunny side up egg, but with sunny on both sides. So you, we, we, have a, we have a central bulge where, um, for, again, you look at the luminosity of these objects, you see that most of the mass of the galaxy is at the center. This center is spherical. And then you have these spiral, spiral arms, uh, roughly, uh, roughly arms, but they're spiral, and they rotate, revolve, well, move around the galaxy center. So these are spiral galaxies. Um, there are other galaxies, elliptical galaxies, but they are not very relevant for our work. Um, so you can uh, so if they are if they are spherical, the ins the center is spherical, and most of the mass is centered in the in the sphere. We can basically roughly model this uh, system as our solar system itself. So if you know the mass here, um, you can calculate how fast they would be moving if they were only moving because of gravity due to the mass here. And so if most of the mass is centered here, which we can see from observation, you should see um, that the velocity goes down as 1 over r squared. Oh, I mean 1 over square root of r, not 1 over r squared, 1 over square root of r, and this is called the Keplerian decline uh, from uh, Johannes Kepler, um, who formulated his uh, laws of planetary motion. However, the troubling thing is when you actually look at the stars and measure their velocities, you see that this, this is pretty much constant. So these are like very, very much exaggerations and only there for pedagogical reasons, but let's see if this will work. Yes. So uh, this is the one that is predicted from uh, observations of luminosities of these stars. So as you go further, the they are moving really, really slowly. So there's a clear velocity gradient as you go along. However, what you see is this. Whoops. Ah, well, you get the point. Um, <laughs> so if you, uh, if you look here, um, you see that the, they are moving at pretty much the same speed because like the, the points here like move out the same. So this was a troubling, um, uh, troubling observation back then, and it was like repeated with several, um, uh, several uh, spiral galaxies. But then um, they looked back at Fritz Zwicky's observation, and they quickly found out that if you uh, if you apply the same idea, same hypothesis that Zwicky had, then you can claim that these are embedded in what we call halos of dark matter. Um, so this is a this is a word that like comes up so much you hear in cosmology that you get, you can basically make a drinking game out of it and get alcohol poisoning. So halo is basically even though dark matter uh, galaxies themselves are usually flattened or disk-like, we expect um, from the uh, from the fitting of the the curve, you, we see that dark matter halo is actually uh, spherical, and so the dark matter is. Uh, spread uh, spherically and it creates a potential well and it's many many times heavier uh, heavier than um, dark uh, heavier than baryonic matter when you uh, compute the total mass of uh, mass inside a galaxy so you have normal uh, visible uh, visible halo that is the halo of the galaxy and you have dark matter extending extending far beyond the visible edges of the galaxy themselves so these were the two uh, primary um, observations that led to our hypothesis and these are the the the, the, the kind of observations that are usually you know directed at public and it's uh, so these are the two evidence uh, well evidence or observations that led to our dark matter hypothesis and more stronger and more recent observation comes from um, gravitational lensing so gravitational lensing is a process uh, well, it's a phenomenon uh, predicted by Einstein general relativity. So I'm pretty sure most of us have uh, heard this before. So the basic idea is that a massive object will uh, curve space time around it. And light, if it passes nearby that object, it will be bent. 
And there are certain uh, nice phenomena you see, like sometimes you see like three different, uh, four different images of an object if they are oriented properly. So the basic idea is the light is bent, and you see objects that are slightly displaced in the uh, in the sky. So let's see. So if the light is bent, so you see the object here, and you see the object here. So this was actually the first uh, test of general relativity, if I remember correctly. So from gravitational lensing observa observations, it is again clear that, uh, so from, lens, uh, from, uh, lensing, from studying lensing, you can infer the total matter of an object. And even from this, you see that uh, the amount of luminous matter cannot create uh, this much lensing effect. So this is considered one of the, uh, one of the main uh, turning points where you, know, you had, you, you had a wide range of cosmologists um, agreeing with the dark matter hypothesis. Uh, this is another, um, this one I got from NASA. You can see a, a galaxy that uh, gravitationally lends as a quasar. Um, it's the same thing I described again. Um, quasars are just really powerful um, light uh, emitting source, sources. They are usually considered to be uh, Act, what we call active galactic nuclei, where we have a black hole uh, actively feeding black hole at the center of galaxies, and sometimes and it has it emits jets, and those sometimes line up, and you see like really really bright objects. Um, so this is so this is uh, the gravitational lensing of the bullet cluster, and this is uh, the turning point in uh, in dark matter cosmology. It's when um, a lot of theories were ruled, a lot of alternative theories were ruled out. So just like the coma cluster. Um, this is actually two clusters, and they are like in, they are commonly called the bullet cluster, but I think this small one is called the bullet cluster, and this one is called something else. But these are formed from uh, the collision of two clusters, and I, as I said, uh, most of the mass of the cluster is actually all the free gases between the galaxies, which is many, many more times more massive than um, the mass of galaxies itself. So what happens is when they collide, the galaxies are spread very thinly, so the, the probability of galaxies uh, like colliding full on is virtually zero. So the galaxies pass through each other. Um, since we assume that, uh, so dark matter is assumed to be non -inter very less interacting, so the dark matter also passes through each other. What happens is the gas, there's significant drag within gas, so the gas uh, collides and it stays behind. If there were no dark matter, Wherever the, the center of mass of gas is, uh, so wherever the center of mass of gas is from observations of X-rays, so these are hot gases and they will uh, emit breaking radiation, Bremsterling. So from that you can see where the gases are. If there were no dark matter, um, the center of mass of gases should pretty much coincide with center of mass inferred from lensing, gravitational lensing. However, we see, so I think this is, uh, this is not the actual color you see in telescopes. Um, this is where the X-ray emission tell you the center of uh, the center of um, gas for the hot uh, center of mass for the hot gases. But from uh, from gravitational lensing, oh, I said the first one is from X-ray observations. This is where you see the center of masses. But from gravitational lensing, we see that there are two distinct. So we from the potential, you see that there are the the center of mass of the whole clusters are shifted. So this is considered one of the, one of the big uh, turning points for dark matter cosmology, as I said. Um, because um, if we go back, um, so both of these observations of uh, clusters and spiral galaxies, they assume that we know how gravity works. Um, and our theories of gravities don't match with what we see up there, which means there must be something else to add up to it. However, alternatively, you could say that maybe we don't understand gravity, and it's our theories of gravity that need to be modified. However, the problem is that those theories explain um, the galaxy rotation curve perfectly. Um, it's called modified, it's one theory, modif uh, modified Newtonian gravity. However, it fails to explain this, and it fails uh, pretty badly, and it's, it's considered the, sometimes some people uh, call it the, the death of Mond. Another thing is um, anisotropy from anisotropic uh, studies of the cosmic microwave background. Um, so as I said, if we go early in the, as we go back in time in the early universe, at one point, 
uh, the, it was so hot that the atoms couldn't form. Like uh, the electrons have enough energy to just bounce around. At that time, if en if electrons are freely moving and you have high den uh, high density, they will constantly interact with photons they, because they can absorb all kinds of photons and the photons would not be able to pass through because you, they, they will have uh, some electrons colliding with them. But at one point, the universe uh, cooled off and atoms started forming. Once atom is formed, uh, it's a, it's a well-known idea, uh, electrons can only absorb certain amount, certain frequencies of light, and then all the light is free to roam around the universe. And so this is that light. So it's called the cosmic microwave background, background radiation. And it's pretty, very even, very evenly distributed. But when you subtract that evenness and some dipole, uh, dipole, uh, dipole anisotropies, you get this. And uh, I'm not going too deeply into this, but these anisotropies and the scales of these anisotropies, they are very well explained by abundance of dark matter. And this is another thing modified Newtonian gravity, the Mond theories, uh, uh, failed to explain. So. We have dark matter. Uh, I think I already said everything about this slide. So we have cold dark matter. As I said, um, our uh, model of cosmology is lambda CDM. So the lambda is the dark energy uh, cosmological constant part. Cold dark matter. So numerical simulations um, tell us that if the velocity of dark matter particles was really high, they will just move around the universe and they will never clump enough to form structure. The galaxies, galaxies is in clusters, clusters in superclusters. We would not see that structure. Um, so our current model that works best is the cold dark matter model. Uh, there are alternative models. As I said, um, we have modified Newtonian dynamics and we also have a superfluid dark matter model. Uh, this is a a relatively new field, um, they propose that um, dark matter goes through phase change in inside the centers of certain kind of galaxies, and it has some other long-range interaction, which leads to some of the uh, some of the galaxy rotation curve issues and all that. Um, but it's uh, there, are, there. I only know two people who are working on this. So. I work with simulations, simulations of dark matter. And before we move into that, I think uh, the need for simulations, why do we need simulations? So we need simulations because um, we have data from the early universe. Um, that is the CMB data that I showed that big uh, map. So that is from about 300,000 years after the supposed Big Bang. Um, the, the, by the way, the Big Bang term was used as a pejorative in its early days as like a joke because people did not believe in that theory. And we just have owned it now. So at the time of, so, so at the, time of um, the, C, uh, the CMB release, we have these anisotropies. So there is, um, I think these are the hot regions and these are the cold regions. So here you have a little more energy density. Um, here you have a little energy densities. And what happens is that these grow up, um, depending on how dense they are, if they can fight the, if they are um, denser and collapse, and they collapse faster than the universe is expanding, they win and they eventually will attract more matter and form structure. Um, so these small density fluctuations, they, from the time of CMB, so that was 300,000 years after Big Bang, and today is of 13.6 billion years, so virtually 13 points, in 13.6 billion years, they increase by 11 orders of magnitude. So small fluctuations grow like massive, and it is hard to do this analytically. So this kind of increase is basically a Eurasian harvest mouse um, go, increasing to the size of Godzilla, 160,000 tons apparently. Uh, so this is so this is one of the problems, but this is just the tip of the manifestly nonlinear iceberg. So the, the, we have um, so we have a well-developed theory of um, gravitational instabilities and how those how those small fluctuations grow up to become structure uh, the structures that we see today. And the theory is um, manifestly nonlinear. We try to use perturbations, uh, but we can use perturbative methods, and uh, I've tried one of them, and they, and they fail very quickly as the as the fluctuate, so the fluctuate, the density fluctuations grow by 11 orders of magnitude. By the time the density fluctuation grows and the um, the delta density is equal to the density, the background density, 
the, the perturbation theory fails, like some of the theories that predict the negative uh, densities and all that. So we cannot use um, analytical physics here. Um, furthermore, more, um, we, we have messy baryonic physics. So the, the, the formation of stars, how the, stuff, the protostars have outflows, and then you have supernova that like push matter out. We have um, uh, black hole uh, feedback, jets from black hole that affect star formation, all sorts of things. And they are all very nonlinear. So this is the need for um, simulations. Um, Matthew effect. So this is basically how structure forms in the early universe. As I said, some parts have a little more energy density than other regions. And as they have more energy density there, they will slightly attract more, um, more matter. And that is that kind of uh, creates a feedback loop of sorts. Like you have more matter, agree, like attracting more matter. And eventually, those kind of things have um, structure formation. So this is actually directly from the cos cosmology text that I used. Um, a semester ago. It's called the, the Matthew effect from um, the Bible. So how does uh, simulation work? So this is a basic idea. Um, so we, uh, we, we don't start with the Big Bang 13.6 billion years ago. We start at the point of CMD because that's where we have the best data. So we have those fluctuations. So we uh, runs by itself. Huh? So we start with a box size. So we want to create a small universe. Um, so we start with a box size of few megaparsecs, um, a few megaparsecs, and we add matter particles evenly distributed there because the early universe was very much homogeneous. Um, so how, how many particles we add um, that determines how our resolution would be. If we add very many particles, we'd have very high resolution. But then we'll also have um, the problem of uh, huge computational time and computational resources. So there is uh, you have to have like this bargain. Um, once you do, um, if you if everything is evenly distributed, we, we won't see anything. So we add minor, uh, we add those small fluctuations that are commensurate with the CMB fluctuations. And so this is at around 300,000 years after the Big Bang. Uh, we usually, in cosmology, use redshift. So this is a redshift of 1,100. Oh, sorry. We, uh, we add this, and we like fast forward it to a uh, redshift of 100, I think. Um, so today's redshift is, uh, would be 0. Uh, and we let, uh, we let the gravity do its job. If we are running a dark matter-only simulation, we let gravity do its job. If we are adding, we are doing dark matter plus Baryon simulations will add the baryonic physics, um, which are which go in as a subgrid prescription because um, um, it's computationally expensive to do them do them from the first principle. So this is made using um, a repo code, and the the code gives you this. Um, so this you can see the structure formation, and you can even see some feedback here. You have matter being um, hurled out of this cluster. Uh, so this is made using a repo code um, and visualization done through Python. So, so this is the thing. Um, so large-scale structures, like structures bigger than the size of galaxies, so this is from observations, and this is from uh, simulations. And they are identical, uh, statistically speaking. Um, so statistically, they are identical. Uh, and this is one of the main reasons that um, lambda CDM cosmology is the standard model of cosmology. It, uh, it fantastically predicts the large-scale structures of the universe. However, um, as we go, um, as we go, start zooming in on our simulations, we start seeing some tensions, and these tensions have been growing. Um, so we are looking at scales of about galaxies, uh, uh, about uh, galaxies of our size and smaller, so Milky Way galaxy uh, and smaller. So we have three problems. Um, basically, these two are um, manifestation of the same problem at different mass scales. So we have what we call substructure problem. It's sometimes called it's sometimes called the missing satellite problem. We have something called too big to fail problem, and we have this older one. And this is a core cost problem. So missing satellite problem. Um, so I think this explains well. So numerical simulations using cold dark matter. So you have some dark matter particle that is uh, uh, that has non-relativistic velocity, and you put that and run simulations. This predicts that. Um, uh, a halo that's the size of Milky Way, so a halo that hosts Milky Way, will have 
many, many more small halos around it than what we have observed. So um, this is many times higher. I think it predicts about 500 different uh, galaxies, uh, halos, and I think observationally we have seen like, so in 1999 we have seen uh, 11 halos, and I think there have been recently we have seen some other very dim galaxies, but there is still a huge discrepancy between what CDM predicts and what um, observations show. And it's not just Milky Way. We have some field galaxies where it's, uh, this discrepancy is seen. So the next question to ask is, what if these halos uh, that the, the numerical simulation predicts are small enough that uh, they can't hold their stars together, hold their gases together, so there is not enough star formation and uh, if there is not enough star formation, they would not be visible. And this is the this was the question, and that led to another problem, too big to fa uh, fail problem. So, if you look closely at Milky Way type environment, by which we mean uh, Milky Way like Milky Way sized halos, we see that there are many many uh, halos, uh, many, many sub halos that are dense enough and large enough that they must have they should be able to host galaxies if they actually did exist. So now this one, so now this one doesn't have a, a, we can't ask a question like that here because this basically answers that there is a discrepancy and it's significant. Uh, so this is the too big to fail problem. So there, there are basically two of the same problems at different mass scales. So the last uh, of these is the core cost problem. And if I remember correctly, this, this was the first problem. So if we look at densities of um, galaxies, uh, mass densities in galaxies at, um, at uh, inner radii, um, our regular cold dark matter simulations show that the density um, go down as 1 over r, uh, increase steadily. This is a log log plot. However, observations show, show that um, the profiles are um, very much uh, flat. So this is called the core cost problem. Um, so this is something that I th from my astronomer friends tell me is a, hard, a bit harder to determine, but evidence has been mounting, and there is so obviously some discrepancy there. So there are many, uh, well, two main classes of solutions. So one solution comes from baryonic physics. Um, we say that um, you have feedback from black holes, um, AGN especially, and you have feedback from neutron stars, you have turbulence, you have outflows, and the, the list is pretty long. And and this is how you, uh, how baryonic physics uh, will possibly able to solve this if it can. Um, the thing is, uh, Baryonic physics has too many parameters, and they are very much underdetermined, and there has been no conclusive work here. The other way to solve this is alternative dark matter models, and this is what we'll be doing. So we have the two-component dark matter model, uh, flavor mixed. Um, so what we propose is that dark matter particles exist in a superposition of uh, two mass eigenstates, uh, so this is uh, quantum mechanical. It, um, so this is, by the way, um, this is not, we didn't randomly choose this. Um, uh, the, the good thing about being cosmologist is that we don't have to invent particles. Um, particle physicists have like a wide range of uh, predicted particles um, that have not been observed, and even some that have been observed but not predicted. Um, so this is uh, actually a thing in neutrino physics, where neutrinos exist in mass eigenstates. So the flavor of the particle determines its interaction. So you have, um, for example, um, if we had electron neutrino, it will interact with electrons, but not with muons. And so, th so the flavor determines how they interact. And mass states determine how they propagate. So if uh, neutrinos won't propagate as a, a flavored particle, they would propagate in their ma uh, mass eigenstates. So this is our theory. Uh, so it's an effective theory for like uh, different possible particles. You have axions, saxions, and all that. Um, our parameters are the mass difference between the states. So this is mass difference divided by the average mass. Um, and so these are free parameters, by the way. And velocity dependent cross section for elastic and inelastic. Uh, I think I wrote collisions. I think I meant interactions. Um, so velocity dependent cross sections for elastic and elas inelastic interactions because I don't think, you, well, you can call it inelastic interactions collisions uh, as well, I guess. Um, so these are our free parameters. As we will see, it is, uh, this is related to kick velocity, which we will come to, I think, next. Um, well, no. Uh, so this leads to 
<laughs> this leads to a really interesting effect. It's called the Munchausen effect. I think my advisor came up with it, and if he did, I, I'm very proud. I'm not sure though. So this is the this is an effect. Uh, this is from Baron Munchausen. Uh, real adventures. So the, it, is, it is said in one of his stories that he pulled his horse and himself out of mud by pulling on his pigtail. It's one of the true stories from the surprising adventures of Baron Munchausen. So we have two CDM kinematics in very um, uh, simplistic terms. We have we have uh, possible interactions between these eigenstates. We have heavy and light eigenstate. Uh, an interesting thing about um, these. Uh, mass eigenstate is that uh, when the particles are non-relativistic, the ma different mass eigenstate will move at different velocities. So for cosmological simulations uh, purpose, you can treat them as two separate particles. And that's what we have done. So what happens is, so this is the kick velocity. So you can have heavy and light particle interact and the heavy particle convert into a light particle. So you have some mass that is lost. And that mass lost uh, uh, is converted to kinetic energy. So, and the velocity of this energy is the kick velocity. So what happens is if we have a big halo with, um, with a pretty high escape velocity, we have these conversions. And the new light particle that is formed, uh, the light eigenstate, um, I'll be calling particle now on, uh, it will have enough kinetic energy to leave the halo. So what happens with from from in, uh, the inside the halo where the density is large, you will have particles escaping. This will flatten the curves there. So this will solve the core cost problem. However, in if the uh, so we remember from our uh, the galaxy rotation curves, we have um, a flat velocity rotational velocity profile. So that you can basically assign um, velocities uh, as uh, proxy for mass of the halo. So if the kick velocity is uh, greater than escape velocity, you can, you can have in small halos both the particles escape. So this is Munchausen and this is his horse. So both of them escape the halo. So what this does is that um, if the halo has a escape velocity, a certain escape velocity that's smaller than kick velocity, you can have all the particles eventually escape and you can have a halo evaporation. So this basically effectively solves our substructure problem. Uh, the missing satellite problem. So, so what happens when we um, do put that inside simulations and run the simulation? So the first thing it should do is our, we have our spectacular success in large-scale structure. So if our model is good, it should keep intact the large-scale structure. Um, and as you can see here, the, the large-scale structure is virtually identical. Um, I think I forgot to put it that. I think this is a 50 megaparsec box. Um, and this was done by a former grad student, um, Alexander Ford, with um, Dr. Medvedev. Um, and this is uh, this, will, this was done with a slightly different version of the code. It's called Gadget, I think. Um, so our 2CDM model keeps intact the successes at um, large-scale structure. But substructure problem. You can see um, that the substructures is effectively reduced here. It is not completely reduced, um, but this is a dark matter-only simulation. Um, Running uh, baryonic simulations is computationally more expensive, so all, all of this work was done by my predecessor, um, whose work I'm following with baryonic physics. So you can see the substructure is effectively reduced. Uh, the core cost problem, um, you can easily see, it's, it's obvious that inside, deep inside the halos where the density is much higher, you, you, you will have significantly more interaction and you can have uh, an effective reduction of cross-section. However, this is not a very big, uh, victory because any self-interacting dark matter model, even if it doesn't have um, different components, will resolve this problem because it will, it will thermalize the inside of the halos. What it won't do is SIDM, a self-interacting uh, dark matter model, it by itself cannot reduce the substructure because all it does is it thermalizes the halo. So you, at best, you have a Maxwellian distribution. And all that can escape is just like one tail of the Maxwellian where like the velocity is really high. So, so this is our success. So, um, so all SIDM, uh, well, we have an early universe um, catastrophe that our model um, seems to solve for free. So the idea basically is that if you go really back um, into early universe, the idea is the early in the early universe, all the particles at some point must have been relativistic, and they must have been really hot. And it, because it was so dense, um, you must have had 
the whatever interaction probability is now, it must have been much, much higher, and we would have exhausted the heavy uh, states because they would all have converted into light states because heavy to light conversion is always kinematically allowed. Um, light to heavy conversion is only kinematically allowed when the light particle has enough kinetic energy that can be converted into those ex that extra mass that appears when uh, there is a change in uh, the mass eigenstate from light to heavy. So, so this, uh, <laughs> this model solves this for free because our mass eigenstates only separate when uh, the particle is non-relativistic. When uh, the particles are relativistic, they both, uh, they, both the eigenstates move at about the same velocity, so there's no separation. So we have, um, how am I doing? Um, so we have um, our model, which solves, effectively solves the substructure problem, as well as a too big to fail problem and the core cost problem. And also um, uh, solves this, uh, it passes this early universe constraint on the heavy state abundance. So we also have a kind of sort of um, <laughs> predictions. So one of the predictions is like whenever you have, um, so neutrinos seem to seem to change flavor when they interact with, uh, like when, when they go through like massive objects. Um, so when we have high uh, heavy eigenstate conversion into low eigenstate or heavy particle into low particle, you have this extra energy. And if the, the particle has enough kinetic energy, um, I guess uh, this is also possible, less, although less likely. So this is an exothermic reaction, and this is endothermic, and these are in principle detectable. We can also have um, annihilation of particles, and that will give rise to uh, photon. Uh, that will give uh, give out photon. The problem is that our uh, uh, the the del M is eight orders of magnitude smaller, about about eight orders of magnitude smaller, which means that the energy released will have an eight, eight orders order of magnitude less uh, a fluctuation that is eight order of magnitude smaller, and that would be kind of sort of difficult to detect. Another thing is our model does not inherently have a mass scale, so a natural mass. Um, we only deal with um, del M over M, so that is kind of problematic. But in principle, you can detect it, and it's an experimentalist's job. <laughs> um, so challenges. So what I'm doing, I unfortunately don't have any conclusive results yet. I'm, I'm just a second-year grad student. Um, so the first problem is economy of computational power. So my predecessor did his work with dark matter-only simulation, and I have to redo that with baryons included beca uh, because, um, well, all, uh, if we want to link our predictions to observations, we need to know what happens to baryons. Um, so th there is a problem of economy of computational power. Um, it can be resolved by scaling, running different uh, high, different resolution uh, simulations at different sizes. Um, but we have recently tried to uh, run uh, zoom-in simulations where you have like a really big box, so you can uh, simulate a significant chunk of the universe. But you choose a specific region where you add very small particles that are high resolution, so you can you kind of sort of have uh, the best of both worlds. Um, the problem with baryonic feedback is it's a it's a massively nonlinear thing, so it takes up um, a lot of computational power, but it also it is also has a it also has a parameter space that is very. Uh, very underdetermined, so there are many knobs you can turn in, turn off, lower, and all that. And they have all been tuned to um, <laughs> produce observational um, results. Uh, they are just tuned right to produce the correct observational re results with the regular CDM model. So that is one thing to keep in mind. And yeah, uh, these are the challenges that I have right now. And this is the bibliography. Um, if you have any questions. significantly is reduced. The thing is, uh, we haven't ruled out, we haven't uh, completely constrained 
that's why I didn't ha have an actual um, slide here. Yeah, this is the one. Uh, the thing is, uh, we haven't completely constrained what the kick velocity would be, what the del m over m would be. We also have not con completely constrained um, what the velocity dependence of the cross section will be. We know effectively it reduces it. We have we haven't completely reduced it because um, there, there we well for one thing we believe that uh, there is more. Uh, uh, Dimmer galaxies to be discovered, and they have been discovered. Not not in the not in the numbers that would look, that could resolve this uh, at all. But there is that, and theoretically, we still uh, haven't completely uh, completely uh, constrained all of this. Also, because we haven't run uh, full baryonic simulations, so we don't have we don't exactly know um, how how it would affect baryons because there are there. They can be affected two ways. We can have baryons deepening the potential, so we can have a, an actual uh, reversal of the substructure suppression. But we can all we can also have the feedback actually being much more than the uh, deepening of the potential, which would even further suppress the substructure. So, so yeah, that's a work under progress. Yes. Roger, thank you very much. I Big steep uh, learning curve, and uh, you've done quite a bit in a year and a half. Um, my, my question was regarding what you plan to do, which is you're going to introduce baryonic matter. Yes. Uh, when you do this, are you introducing a neutral baryonic matter, or do you, are they charge separated? Um, we wouldn't expect them to be uh, charge separate. There, there isn't much charged particles. Uh, we we do have you know plasma and stuff, but um, I think their effects are. Mostly local because we don't in the universe we don't see a lot of um, charged okay. particles. Yeah. No, I agree. So in that case, how would uh, baryonic matter differ, differ from uh, dark matter because they're only interacting gravitationally? No, 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 no. Uh, but baryonic matter is not just interacting. Um, and, uh, if it is interacting just gravitationally, it's the same thing as dark matter for effect effectively. So we have star formation. Um, with proto stars, you can have they, they they are expelling matter outside. You have supernova that is also put into that, and that that was it was found to be very important much later when uh, simulations were um, simulations when the f when the first simulations uh, when the first simulations were done, they only did it dark matter only, and they did it very successfully at large scales. But as they started probing deeper and deeper, they very re quickly realized that uh, baryons are actually very important at galactic levels. So supernovae are um, much more abundant uh, than um, we, we have dark matter you know, black hole feedback. We have um, uh, accreting black, actively feeding black holes in the center of galaxies that will have those jets. And they apparently affect. Um, they can virtually stop star formation because they will heat up the gas and it will escape the potential. So, what type of uh, baryonic interaction are you doing? Baryonic interaction with dark matter? No, with the baryons themselves. That's right. Oh, so we we don't we, we can't do that because uh, that's just computationally impossible. We do it as a subgrid. Well, for example, if we have so we have gas particles and. Um, we have subgrid prescriptions in that if the gas particle is yay big in this region, and it, if its temperature is that much, uh, convert it into star. So, and if, if there is a star, um, if um, if the star is if, if the star satisfies certain things, convert it into supernova, and then it will increase the temperature here like this. So, we cannot do the, the actual doing doing it from first principle is impossible computationally for now. Yes. Mr. Robinson, you have mentioned that uh, high resolution baryonic and dark matter simulations are tuned to match observational scaling relations, which is true because we observe those scaling relations from observational measurements. Are you, even when you work in baryonic matter, are you not going to include those? Those are you not going to no, no, no. Uh, so we, we don't. At, at least at the beginning, we what we want. Um, we have people working on baryonic physics. We, we they, they are experts in their simulations. We just take them. But it is a point to be kept in mind because some like not uh, the parameters in baryonic physics. They are not strongly as strongly constrained as to you know uh, like predict all, all sorts of things um, because all these simulations they. They, they are quickly adding more and more stuff because, for example, the last time I remember, the first Aripo did not, uh, they included like a blanket uh, 
uh, interstellar gas or intergalactic gas. So they are changing that. Um, and they are, they are improving and adding things because we recently got an update. So we, we are not planning to like change those knobs, but that is something to be mindful of. And some of those are actually tuned. Uh, some of them are cons strongly constrained by observations, but I'm pretty sure there are, there are certain uh, processes where they just uh, tune it to match the observations. And I know that because I think if there, there isn't even like consensus on what baryonic feedback looks like because we have another group that have a completely different baryonic feedback model. They call it bursty feedback. Uh, they call their simulations fire simulations, and their feedback is completely different. I think I've seen it. Yeah, so, so it's, not a, it's not extremely constrained, so that is something to be mindful of when adding baryons. Yes? So are, you, so are you only adding gas particles that can turn into stars and supernova under certain conditions? And is that all the baryonic matter that you're adding, or are you also adding something that represents the central supermassive black hole? Um, currently, in the, the simulations I have done, we haven't added uh, AGN, but there, there is option for AGN, and for a, for a realistic simulation, we need to have AGN feedback. It, it, it is not thought that they would uh, significantly change, um, it would not uh, change, change a large-scale structure. Um, however, it changes how it looks because it can significantly suppress star formation. So, uh, yeah, it, it, it can... Uh, change how, what you can observe and what you can, and that's important because that is where the predictive power comes from. Great. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions for Mr. Adekari? Yes. Can you go forward one more slide? Backward, you mean? Uh, yeah, back, yeah, this guy. Yeah. Um, I want to make sure I was following the top, the direct detection is whenever the heavy and the light states interact with like paragonic matter, right? And then yes. the bottom here when they interact with one another. Yes. Okay. That's your question? Yeah, that's my question. Okay. It, it was kind of late in the presentation. I, was, I would like this presentation. Thanks. Any questions? Well, let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank you all for coming. Did we check the chat to make sure Johnson didn't have a... Uh, I mean, that's basically, if he had a question, he'd pop up on that phone. Okay. Yeah, the, for some reason, the camera, which we spent all that time setting up, just stopped. Like, they're not seeing this at all. Oh. oh. And so that's why I was holding that phone the entire time. That was literally the camera feed for the guys watching. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. So thank you all for coming. And stay tuned for when we have our next speaker.